Good morning, it's about 9.30. I am at the Ingalls Avenue boat launch in Troy, where I've been for the past uh, two days in the general area. I wanted to give you an update on how the launch went in the last two days and tell you about sort of the planning process for my first significant uh, mileage trip uh, this afternoon. Uh, so let's just start right off. Um, Friday was uh, a day where there were, the boat was still in the driveway. There was a bunch of work to do between staining and uh, affixing the registration and letters and just a lot of odds and ends. And, um, you know, I had a lot of help. Uh, but also, you know, one thing I wanted to do uh, this time was really think about or stop thinking about authorities, police, etc., as, uh, you know, obstacles to my trip. I mean, I'm doing everything legally. There's no reason why I should have a problem. I'm 41 years old, you know. I'm not drinking and, and boating. Um, and uh, government is really the purpose of government is to facilitate things. So if I'm not doing anything wrong, why not tell them ahead of time and see how they can help? Um, so I uh, actually reached out to um, uh, Assemblyman McDonald, who represents this entire area, and you know, told him what I was doing, and he was very helpful. He contacted the uh, Troy chief of police, um, who basically said, "Yeah, there's nothing really to do. Just to trailer it down to the river if you don't have, you know, as long as it's the right size, and I don't need any special permits, which I don't. I built it specifically uh, so that it's under eight feet wide, um, so that I can transport it on the water." And uh, you know, their suggestion. I wanted to go down Ingalls Avenue in Troy, which is, I would say, you know, this kind of steep. Um, my dad, uh, the assemblyman, the chief of, of police, uh, all my friends said, why don't you take it down Hoosick Street? I was like, oh my God, it's so busy on that street. Uh, but nonetheless, the grade is a lot less, the slope is a lot less, and there are not a lot of overhanging wires. Um, so I had lots of help getting this thing uh, going. Um, same, uh, by the way, goes when it comes to authorities for the, uh, for the Erie Canal Corporation. They've you know, I, I reached out to a, a friend of mine, uh, a couple of friends of mine who work for the corporation, and they have been nothing but helpful. I mean, they gave me this hat right here. They said they can, you know, help me talk to the lock tenders. They uh, recommended uh, the New York State Canal website's uh, notice to mariners. Um, just really, really helpful. I feel like I've got a lot of support th uh, this time, uh, which, is really, which is really good. Um, so, yeah, getting the boat ready, you know, I had parents, I had neighbors, I had old friends. One thing I have learned within the last year is to ask for help and do it specifically. You know, there was a, uh, a period last year where I lost somebody really close and people would say, can I come over? And I would say, yes. They would say, what can I bring? I would say, oh, nothing, because I didn't want to inconvenience them. You know, and then I kind of look. I, I would say, you know, honestly, I need cat food. I need uh, milk, I need X, Y, and Z. It's kind of the mundane things. And people would be happy to stop by to do that. And it really, you know, taught me a lesson. That when you need help, just say it. And then people will often do it. I mean, they, because they want to. I mean, they've offered their help to begin with. It'd be kind of weird if they didn't then, you know, do what you asked for. So I asked people, you know, specifically for help, you know, uh, Dan, can you help me, you know, uh, gird up the underside of, the, uh, uh, of the, the front of the boat? You know, Mom, can you help me stain and affix the letters, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, all that was good. And there were really no problems with the launch um, at all. I, you know, it was the best time. This is probably the 11th boat contraption that I've put in the water. This was the least kind of stressful out of all of them. The only problem was that uh, by the time we did launch, it was about a half an hour before sunset, and then we had all this gear, so I'm just like making a bucket brigade and throwing that gear inside the cabin here, you know, every which way. But the, uh, you know, electrical system still wasn't working, so I didn't really have any lights. I ended up picking up two uh, solar-powered, like, uh, bush illuminating lights that are in my yard and bringing them down here and actually lighting a candle but there was really no way on my first night to kind of like clean up the cabin so it was it was rather stressful um, so this is Ingalls Avenue boat launch it's right below the uh, federal dam in Troy um, 
about a quarter mile south of here is an island called Adams Island. Um, one of the uh, pillars that hold up the Route 7 bridge are actually at the, at the southern tip of Adams Island. Um, so what I did was I used my electric motor because I was having problems with my gas motor, used my electric motor to go that quarter mile over to Adams Island and anchored in what I knew was low water, uh, uh, little depth of water, um, let out anchor chain, knowing that when the water receded because it was uh, the middle of a, of a receding tide, an ebb tide, that when the water went out, I would bottom out intentionally. Um, that's a good thing that I like about the Hudson that I'm gonna kind of lose. It's annoying to have to fight the tides, but you can use the water as a hydraulic lift. So if you have to work on a part of the boat, then you would have to be underwater normally to work on it. I found over the years that if you can kind of set things right uh, during a high tide, then when the water goes out, you can almost leave your boat up on blocks and then get under and do any repairs that you need to do. So that's really good about the Hudson. I won't have that after I go through the dam because once you go through the dam and the lock, there's no more tidal effect uh, north of Troy. You know, spent a kind of sleepless night, uh, intentionally sleepless. I kept setting the alarm because I wanted to make sure I didn't break my anchor, et cetera. I haven't done this now since 2018, so it's been like seven years. Um, you know, I got to yeah, I got I kind of like refresh myself. It's a bit like riding a bike, but I wanted to make sure that as I was sleeping, I could look up and see trees. Um, so I knew I didn't break an anchor. So I kept waking you know, myself up about every 15 minutes. Uh, the next day, uh, I decided what the heck I was, you know, I was grounded out as I expected. I had an anchor and I figured, uh, let me circumnavigate uh, Adams Island, which is just a tiny island, uh, probably the last main island, I guess, before you get to the lock here. You know, rather unremarkable, except, you know, there was some surface coal, um, you know, the, the seemed like a lot of shale. I, I would say, like, maybe once you get south of Albany, I think we're on a sort of geological divide it becomes uh, uh the islands are a lot more like alluvial made of like silt whereas this island surprised me that it was made so much of rock um anyway i went around when i came back to my boat the boat was uh floating the tide had come up a barge had come by those two combinations uh made it jump its anchor and uh float sort of into uh into the into the river, so I had to uh, jump off and swim out to it and, uh, t you know, turn the electric motors on and bring it back. That was uh, uh, an, an annoying experience and uh, one I will make sure never to make again by making sure that I run uh, a shoreline from the bow of the boat uh, whenever I'm not on it. Uh, and then yesterday, you know, it was a, it was a, a beautiful day yesterday. Basically, I went over to the top of Green Island, and I'm sorry, I don't know the name of this other island that's right above it. There's a little bit of an inlet with a sandy beach. That was great. So I went in there, bottomed out. The sand, a sand bottom won't damage my boat. It's you know, specifically designed to be able to ground out. I put lots of fiberglass on it, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so then I was able to get out. I was able to clean. Man, how therapeutic it is to clean. You know, I took everything off put everything back in a somewhat more organized fashion. I have more to do, but you know, sort of identify, this is stuff I don't really need, but it got thrown onto the boat. Uh, this is stuff I need to get back from my house. And you know, that's one of the purposes of making sure that I spend about five days in this area before I set sail so I can continually go back. I've been back to my house three times now. Um, I got the windmill reattached. I had taken that off for, uh, uh, for uh, transportation purposes and uh, I got the motor working. You know, the motor is from 1965. It's a little, uh, there's a lot wonky to it. I mean, I'm, t I'm steering it with a tiller instead of a steering wheel uh, because the cable system just wouldn't kind of work with the way I've got everything set up internally. And, uh, you know, I haven't run it for like two years, or about, you know, significantly. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, messing around with the throttle controls and the manual choke controls, etc. Not to mention this bulb on this gas tank uh, doesn't seem to work. Luckily, I've got two gas tanks and two bulbs, so uh, you know my I got it working and that was good. Uh, my friend Justin came over and he was working on the electrical system. The main problem with the electrical system is this charge controller. Um, 
uh, which has all of these functions like a Game Boy uh, sort of display that you've got to go through, but with no instruction manual. Good news is everything seems to be working. My windmill uh, was going like a bat out of hell yesterday in the wind that we had. It, you know, it registered a charge. Everything seems to be working, including the inverter. So now I have lights and a means to charge my batteries when I don't have shore power. I also have a four bank uh, charge charger. So when I do have uh, shore power, I can plug in and you can hit buttons to say this is a lead acid battery, this is a lithium ion battery, et cetera, you know, because they require different chargers. Um, so that's good. Um, and uh, by the time my, my friends Katie and Kay and Rob came over later, I had set up basically things. So I have like a, a writing desk. So I'm, I'm sitting in the middle of the boat right now. And I've got these removable sort, uh, 16 inch pieces of plywood supported by joists that go across the back of the boat. When it rains, I put those out and it makes it into um, like if you have a pickup truck with a cover on the back so it doesn't get wet. But I can move them uh, and either have it as like an, a totally open sort of pickup truck or I can have counter space basically. So that's uh, been really nice and functional. So today, um, I'm trying to go down to my hometown of uh, New Baltimore. I'd really love to be able to, to say, to go to my parents' house and walk from their house down to the river, which is only a mile, uh, you know, and have my boat there. And, and maybe my dad's like watching the boat so it doesn't float away. So that I could say I left on foot from my parents' house and ended up in New Orleans. I think that would be kind of cool. Um, no, plus, I would also like to, I've never done this before, I would like to go to either the Boathouse Marina or um, the Queeman's Marina and tie up and, you know, pay for a night and see what that whole process is. Do you call ahead of time? Do you just show up? And what if you eat a meal? Do you get to stay for free? How, how does that work? Um, so I've got to get south, you know, those 30 miles, maybe something like that. It's nine to Albany. I think, I think Albany is, uh, you know, 12 from to, to Ravina. So, you know, 21 miles, something like that. You know, there's a bit of a sinuousness. Let's call it 25 miles. Anyway, um, the wind is coming due north uh, until two o'clock. The tide is also rising until two o'clock. At two o'clock, the river will be full. And then it's going to start the ebb tide after a small period of slack water. The water will start to go out and that will carry my boat with it. Over the years, I've estimated that on the Hudson, maybe you get a mile, extra mile, you know, one mile out, uh, out of the tide. The wind is the bigger factor. You've got so much freeboard, they call it, so much surface area above the water that if you've got a strong wind coming in the opposite direction of the tide, the wind is going to win. You're either not going to go anywhere or you, you might even float backwards. So luckily at two, instead of coming due north at me, the wind is forecasted to change, basically come from the, from the, I guess that would be a south wind. It's, yeah, but it's coming north, right? So then it's changing to a, uh, like a southeasterly or southwesterly, I guess, wind. So it'd be coming at me from, you know, let's say two o'clock on the, on the clock, you know? Um, uh, that'll generally change until like 11 o'clock when it'll actually be at my, at my around five o'clock behind me. Uh, unfortunately, the tide runs out at 8.30. So I really got to kind of like play it by ear and, and see things, how everything functions. Does this go into the wind well, or am I just burning gas and not getting anywhere, uh, et cetera. And again, that's a, the other, you know, purpose of uh, spending five days on the Hudson, uh, where I'm familiar, you know, with the sort of ins and outs and peninsulas and things like that, and what the bottom is like, um, especially the area between, I'd say, Albany and uh, Ravina. So right now, you know, I woke up in the morning, clean things again. That seems to be a good way to start a good routine. I've got my ba some batteries charging back at my house. I don't really have much charge right now because there's no wind and there's very little uh, sun, but my batteries, you know, seem to have a good amount of juice, the ones that are on board. Uh, yeah, I took off a bunch of junk to bring it home. Uh, and yeah, so it's just a little thing here. I mean, the Hudson is 
an extension of the Erie Canal and vice versa. You know, the Hudson comes north from New York City, goes past Albany, which is the capital, goes past Troy. At Troy, there's a dam. And, you know, just a mile or two north of that dam is where the Mohawk River uh, intersects with the Hudson. And that's the beginning of the Erie Canal at Waterford. At Waterford is a, is a flight of five locks, one, two, three, four, five, that bring you up like, I don't know, 145 uh, feet or something. It's a huge, significant uh, jump. Um, and then you're in the Erie Canal, and that goes out to Buffalo, and that uh, connects the Great Lakes. So you've got one big waterway. You know, as we were uh, talking here, you know, I just saw a gigantic boat go by, maybe 40 feet, looked like it was three stories. It was called R&R &R from uh, Millica Hill, New Jersey. I don't, don't know where that is, but I'm going to guess that they're doing the Great Loop. So they're coming up from New Jersey, coming up the Hudson River, going out the Erie Canal, and then they'll go through the Great Lakes. And then at Chicago, there's a little canal that brings you to the Mississippi. And then you can go down the Mississippi, go through the Gulf of Mexico, and then come back up the intercoastal waterway. Um, they call that the Great Loop, so everything's connected. But in terms of the Hudson and the Erie Canal, I really think of them as kind of the same thing. You know, people would come from the West with, I'd say, raw materials, farm uh, produce, come through the Erie Canal, and then they would take the Hudson River. A lot of times they would transfer from a barge into a sloop or a sailing vessel to go down the Hudson River, and then your market was either New York City or anywhere in the world because you can leave uh, into the ocean from New York City. And the other process was that people would come up the Hudson River and out the Erie Canal either with uh, immigrants uh, or uh, you know, finished products, things that you needed in the West. So there was this constant uh, exchange, almost like an alternating current between the Great Lakes and the breadbasket of the United States and the industrial emporium of New York City. You know, people say the Erie Canal is what made New York into the Empire State. It really made New York as a port. You know, by the time it was built a few years later, it had outpaced Philadelphia and Boston. I mean, everything went through New York City. And also we told for it, you know, so we made a lot of money as a state. Uh, Gerard Koppel wrote a book called Bond of Union, you know, and he said that his thesis was that by making the Midwest, all of those states out there, having their economic interest aligned with New York City, whereas before the Erie Canal, their economic interest was aligned with New Orleans because it was much cheaper to go, what I'm doing, go down the Ohio River to the Mississippi south rather than over the Appalachian Mountains to the eastern seaboard. So western Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, um, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, a lot of those states it, that during the Civil War were part of the Union, they might have had an economic interest with the South, or maybe they would have stayed out of it and said, you guys fight it out. Who knows? So the Erie Canal being constructed, uh, you know, really impacted American history and also maybe made us into one country instead of, you know, six or seven different countries, the way the continent of Europe is divided up. Um, I actually think about it as an electrical circuit. You've got all of this energy, which is the raw materials, the farming, everything that was in the Midwest. And you've got New York City where you've got this need that's like a negative pole. And when you connected them via the Erie Canal, you've got a voltage that is now moving in an alternating current di direction, bringing people out, finished products out, grain, hogs, meat, everything in the other direction down, boom, and we're connected. And what happened to New York? They're like an appliance that's powered by the Erie Canal, at least it, from 1825 uh, onward until maybe so somewhat recently. So that's the Erie Canal. That's what I'm doing today. Uh, and uh, it's nice to broadcast uh, to you from Troy at the Ingalls Avenue boat launch. Thanks.